Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, this panel is great because our discussion is great because I think back to our first college summit, and at that point, the goal of the event was to help schools understand why they should be expanding their video production department. Um, now, it's about how they can manage their own networks, uh, their, their OTT services, in-depth digital customer relationships. So it's great to have you with us, John. Um, My pleasure, Ken. So I know you've been at Syracuse for three years, but let's go back in time. I think your career begins when cable boxes, most people here probably don't remember them. They had like a little lever across the top that would go from zero to 30. Um, so where, let's go back to your ESPN You're telling me days. I'm old, right? You're telling me I'm old. Well, I guess the yeah, older, let's call it. So you have, you, have, you, have a, you have a very successful long career, let's call it that. So where, where, where did you start, when did you start at ESPN? I started in uh, October 1980, and uh, yeah, I was a production assistant, and at that time ESPN was really a glorified startup, and we had no idea whether it was going to work, and most of us were relatively young, fresh out of school, we were sports fans, we were interested in sports media, we were like, okay, this is pretty cool, and if it works, great, and if not, we'll go get real jobs someplace else. Right, right. Well, you, you hit on it there, and I want to kind of draw on that experience from those early days. Because you said, you know, if it works and if not, then we'll go somewhere else. But I think a lot of the schools are in a similar situation in terms of their, the infancy of a lot of these digital networks and their own, you know, ambitious programming and production uh, efforts. So what, what do you think you learned in those early days that can translate to schools of all sizes and athletic departments of all sizes that are kind of figuring out their way forward, where to put their limited resources at this point, how to grow properly. Um, what are some things you drew up from back in those days? Well, I think the, 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 the common thread throughout all of it is, is engagement, right? Engagement with fans. ESPN, we're trying to grow a business. All right, to grow a business, we've got to, we had to create fans. We had to make fans. Um, and we needed the content that would make them come to, to ESPN. And probably the, the breakthrough event for us was the early rounds of the NCAA men's basketball tournament, which heretofore had gone untelevised. That really put ESPN on the map, legitimized ESPN. I think for colleges, for, you know, for individual schools, is the, the ability and the opportunity for us to engage with our fans, with our alumni base, and to deepen that engagement not only benefits athletics, but it benefits the university as well. So you've been on the job at Syracuse for three years. Um, did you f now, when you took that job on, did you feel that your skill set was going to go out the window? I mean, how do, you know, because that's, that's a hard transition for a lot of people to sit there and say, you know, my, my expertise is in TV production, and, and now I'm going to go into uh, being an athletic director. So that's... You know, it, it's, it's different. Some of it went out the window. Some of it was still applicable. Um, it was, it was kind of neat to kind of take yourself and, and, and maybe put yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit, which it was. I had a lot to learn. Um, and I remember the first staff meeting, I told the staff, full staff, 200 people, I said, I have more to learn than anybody in this room, and I'll commit to do it. And fortunately, I've got a great staff. Um, I really developed relationships throughout the university. You know, I found, and, and I think there's a common, uh, common thought that, well, all right, there's, there's tension between athletics and academics, and I think there's ways to bridge that. And we worked really, really hard to... To bridge that, we develop great partnerships across the university that benefits not only athletics, but benefits academics, benefits our undergraduate students, benefits our graduate students as well. So how do you, um, let, let's touch on that a little bit, because obviously you have the Newhouse School, which is pretty good, right? Pretty uh, rock solid. That, so. That's an advantage. Yeah. So were you, were you surprised when you got there that there wasn't a really tight integration there between the departments? I, I was, and um, it was one of the things that early on, is I met with every dean, and I went to their office, and I just wanted, it was a very simple message. Athletics, we want to be a good partner. And if there's opportunities for us to partner with your school, things that you're doing, we want to, we want to do that. And that's really opened up the doors, and I think it was refreshing for them. I think it was refreshing for athletics. Um, with Newhouse, um, you know, I went down and really got the backstage tour of the facility from Neil Coffey who is uh, head of operations in engineering for the Newhouse School. And I came back and knowing that we're preparing to launch for the ACC network, I'm like, we've got this unbelievable asset and we need to partner and we need to leverage this asset for the benefit again, not only athletics, but also the Newhouse School. So what was the, because um, I think p other people have tried this at schools, some successfully, some not successfully, and others, their departments have found that they just, they kind of 
cannot get engaged with the academic side. So what were some of the learnings there? What are some of your tips as far as someone who may be struggling with establishing these relationships to, is it a trust thing? What's, what's sort of the, what's, how did you kind of go about it? Some of it's a trust. To, to me, it's, it's, it was incumbent upon myself in athletics. We needed to extend ourselves, right? We needed to go to them. And I don't say that in a negative way, but I thought it was incumbent. All right, if we really want to establish a partnership, we need to be proactive. Let us work to establish that partnership. And in the case of, of Newhouse and, and Lorraine Branham, who um, tragically passed recently, Lorraine was a tremendous colleague to work with. And she was 100% supportive. And she got it immediately that if we do something, it can benefit undergraduate students, it can benefit graduate students. We can leverage this, these facilities. It's a tremendous marketing tool for Newhouse. So, you know, there really wasn't a hard sell there. It was pretty much, okay, you know, this is a natural, so let's figure out how we do it. So then how will you leverage, well, let's go, with how, how have you leveraged the school so far, and then how will it be leveraged beginning in August when the, when the official network gets on the air? Yeah, just we've, we've got three control rooms in Newhouse, um, and with the help of Scott Hecht and Kristen Hennessy and Tom White, we basically we added, we added uh, upgrade some equipment, primarily replay graphics, et cetera, that type of thing. But you know, we worked with Newhouse to do this in a way that all three control rooms are, are production, you know, live event ready. Um, we worked with individual professors. They developed curriculum around ACC Network Extra, around being uh, in the control room having responsibilities uh, for particular, you know, whether it's you're running camera, audio, switching, et cetera, that type of thing, in front of the camera as well, opportunities for not only play-by-play -play people, but analysts and, and reporters as well. So it was, really, it was a very comprehensive uh, effort, um, but one that was incredibly, incredibly smooth. It seems as if from, from the outside looking in to any university, from, from my perspective, that if there isn't a good relationship there, the people who lose are the students, because there are a lot of students, clearly, as you know, who are interested in broadcasting careers, either on air or behind the camera. Um, is that, a, if someone is having problems getting engaged with, with that department, should they play that card, if you will, by saying something like, you know what, this is, yeah, it's great for our department, but it's also in the interest of the students and their career development? Absolutely, because it is, and we've got 13 uh, Newhouse students who graduated in the class of 2018 that are either working at ESPN, Fox, and RSN or in front of the camera, behind or in front of the camera. And that's only going to continue to grow. And just the experience that, that these young people get, the live practical experience, I mean, it's, it's an incredible advantage to them as they go out in the marketplace, they go out in the workforce. So, Yes, and then it also, again, the school should, should leverage that as part of their marketing, right? We're all in the business of trying to track students, the highest quality students we can. Well, when we can offer opportunities like this, it's, it's a very, very attractive uh, proposition to the overall sales pitch. Sure, sure. So as far as your, um, those early days when you came over to Syracuse, what, 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 was there anything that surprised you along with just that lack of a relationship with the Newhouse School, but as far as the role and, and how did you develop? I mean, everybody, everybody can always learn from someone who change their career and learn, learned how to adapt their career because, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. So was there anything that surprised you when you got into the, the, the uh, school side of things? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the school side, again, it was building relationship, it was building bridges, it was, it was making connections with people. And if you do that, um, the, my, the, the deans were incredibly receptive. So there was no resistance. There was receptiveness, and there was like, all right, let's figure out ways we can work together. And Newhouse is maybe the primary example, but uh, the Falk School of, of, of Sport Management, we've done a number of things with them, whether it's analytics, whether it's sales, whether it's nutrition-based, um, the Whitman School as well, the I School um, through Sidearm Sports and Qs.com. So there's a number of partnerships that we've developed across campus, and Tommy Powell, who's our athletic provost, part of his job responsibility is he is athletics direct liaison at working with the individual college or university to, to explore where those mutually beneficial relationships um, you know, can be discovered and implemented on. So, so now with a, with a staff of 200, 
that you came into? How did you look to build relationships with them? Because some people come into a new position like yours, and they'd be like, we're cleaning the house. This is my show. I want all my own people here. Other people come in. They say, look, I'm going to try to establish relationships, sort through staff, get an understanding of people's strengths, weaknesses, work with them. How did you kind of approach that? Well, it's, it's a really interesting question because when I came in, if you count the two interim ADs, I was the fifth AD in 18 months. All right, so. Good you know, track record there. It's, yeah, longevity, <laughs> I'm not real good. Um, but part of it, frankly, is when you have that much change at the leadership level, I mean, you know, people begin to question, right? And it's only natural, and it starts with kind of self-preservation. So I really wanted to take the time to get to know people, to kind of understand the culture, the issues, and then it was incumbent upon me to establish credibility with them that I'm totally invested in this, that I am 100% committed to Syracuse University, to our athletic department, 100% committed to you know, working and developing them. And you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have to terminate anyone. And we had some people over a period of time, once they understood what our values, once our expectations were, that they just, you know what, they weren't, it wasn't their cup of tea. And that's okay, you know, that's, you know, and they've moved on, and they moved on, and those transitions were very professional, um, amicable. Many of them are still, you know, friends of ours, but they weren't, they just weren't ready to commit what we needed to have people commit to. And then I think what we have done is we've really built a culture that's based on collaboration. And it's collaboration, it's transparency, it's, you know, it's, it's built on, you know, it's built on team. And... You know, it doesn't mean that we don't debate. We debate, rigorous debate, I think is really, really good as long as it's respectful. Um, at the end of the day, when a decision's made, everybody has to own it. You may have been on the other side of the argument of that issue, but at the end of the day, once a decision's made, everybody owns it and everybody has to work to implement it. And then when you see, when, when the staff experiences and they understand where you get wins, Okay, you know what, getting groups together, getting the marketing group or the ticketing sales staff or communications group or whatever, or the development group, and working on projects, and you get wins on the board, then all that does is that just creates, you know, that, you know, credibility throughout the organization, and others start, okay, you know what, this can work. And I think now, you're never done building your culture. I'm a big culture person, and I learned that from my time at ESPN, and I spent so much time covering professional sports, and it became clear to me why some organizations are successful year after year after year, because they really have a defined culture, which they don't veer from. And I also equally understood why some franchises, like my Buffalo Bills, that's where I grew up, it was like a reboot every three years, because there kind of was no defining culture. And it's all right, every three years a new staff's in. All right, here comes a new staff, here comes, and you can never, establish any kind of a culture that way. And I think you listen to coaches, the best coaches, collegiately and professionally, just just listen the number of times they reference the word culture. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so the nature of the careers of a lot of people in this room is change, right? Students are coming through programs, athletes are coming into programs, coaches are coming into programs, leaving. Um, so how do you, how should they um, I know this wasn't our prepared questions, but how can they, uh, you know, create their own culture, if you will, when there is so much constant change? I mean, you have it right now. It's, obviously, at Syracuse, there's still change, right? Players come in, leave. So how do you build a culture? How can they, and let's start with that, simple. How do you, how do you go about building it? What's the first two couple steps on building a culture? Yeah, I think you've got to, I mean, the one thing we did is we created a very simple mission statement because when I got there, I asked, I was like, do we have a mission statement? And at ESPN, we had a mission statement. It was really simple, to serve sports fans anytime, anywhere. And if I had a dollar for every time that was uttered in a meeting, you know, I'd have an island in the Caribbean, okay? I mean, that was, re it, it, it really permeated the entire company. So I asked, I said, do we have a, you know, do we have a, a mission statement? And they're like, yeah, we do. I'm like, great, can I see it? And they're like, yeah, and it's four and a half pages. I'm like, well, who's really going to remember four and a half pages? So we really boiled that down. My senior staff and I, we talk about rigorous debate. We had great debate into one simple sentence is to create and foster a culture of academic and athletic excellence to prepare student athletes to be leaders in a global society, period. All right, so what are we here for? We're here to develop young people. 
okay, to their absolute best, both academically and athletically. So that's what our job is, all right? So everybody, if that's what our job is, then we've got our values. And these are the values, this is how we're gonna do our job. And you know, if you don't subscribe to those, you're not gonna be part of the organization. If you do subscribe to those, you know what? You're gonna have an opportunity to flourish in the organization and be a part of something that I think is pretty special. So we have this launch of this network. And the, the other thing I'd add too is then when you have that, then you have people in your organization who become culture carriers. So it's just not me, you know, pontificating. It's, it's again, it permeates, the, it permeates the department. And you get others just by, by nature. They become culture carriers for you. And they help spread that culture and they help develop their areas or they de help develop new staff and you know, indoctrinate and orientate new staff in terms of, right, here's what we're here to do and here's how we do it. So, so then we have this ACC network being launched and obviously there's the digital side of that. I mean, is it as simple for those people who are involved in, in production of, those, of your, all, all the events to simply say, um, you know, we're supposed to serve the Syracuse University fans anytime, anywhere? I mean, can they simply take the ESPN moniker? And so that, that's the era we're in right now, it seems like. Yeah, in, in a sense. And it's, again, we're, you know, we're promoters of our brand. We're marketers of our brand. Um, we're, in terms of engagement with our fans, engagement with our alumni, you know, athletics has a huge megaphone. So how do we use that, you know, in the most effective way that we possibly can? And again, I think all of us, you know, we're all trying to develop our brand, right, and brand equity. And, you know, we've got to use the, the resources that we have, that you collectively have, you've got to use that in ways that are going to promote your overall brand. And not just the brand of athletics, but we do a number of things also where we will help brand things or promote initiatives at the university um, as well. Gotcha. So we do have, if there's any questions in the audience, please feel free to raise your hand. And uh, we have some mics roaming around, so we're always open for questions. Are there any questions at this point? No questions. Okay, that's good, I guess. So I'm going to go into, I'm going to dive into something that I think everybody in this room deals with, and it's going to go back to your ESPN days, um, which is developing on-air talent and finding the, the right talent and the importance of talent. Um, I was talking with somebody a couple weeks back, and they were saying, hey, you know, you could have a 20-camera show. But if the talent stinks, the show's going to stink. And you could have a two-camera show, but if the talent's good, the show's going to be good. So every school, obviously, is looking for, for kids who want to call these games. A lot of kids who work for the schools, or they're hiring people. Um, what's your sense on how to go about, uh, let's take the ICC network. So we're going to have this explosion of content being delivered. Um, there's going to be probably a, a higher threshold to have good talent or people know what they're doing. So how, when you were at ESPN, how did you go about interviewing talent? What were you looking for? and what should people in the room be looking for? When they're talking, obviously they're probably talking to people who maybe not have a lot of experience. So how do you kind of go about that? Yeah, I think in the, because working with the talent department at ESPN, and we were constantly on the search for talent, right? And I think play-by-play -play people and studio anchors in particular. Well, studio anchors, one of the things I always emphasize, can they write? And I think that is an underrated skill. Um, you know, Scott Van Pelt is really, really, you know, he's a tremendous talent. He is a phenomenal writer. The fact that he's a phenomenal writer helps him be a tremendous talent. I think obviously is the ability to, you know, to naturally connect with an audience, you know, and personality. What you can't do is you necessarily can't mold people. You've got to kind of let them be who they are. I mean, Dick Vitale has violated every rule of broadcasting for 40 years, okay? And I'm like, the only thing I used to do is when I produced them every once in a while, I'd tell the audio guy, close his mic. Right. Just so when, you know, for, for 45 seconds, they'd hit me on talk back. My mic's dead, my mic's dead. My mic. Yeah, hold on, Dick, don't say anything for a while. That's how I got him to lay out. I finally told him that after I left. Um, you know, Stephen A. Smith is Stephen A. He's a big personality. So you've, you know, you've got to let people be who they are, channel and funnel them in a way that is going to help you accomplish the objectives of your organization in your, uh, in, in your network. But I think in terms of young people, it's, it's you know, do they have kind of the fun, fundamental skill set? And I think too often now is young people, okay, what's my shtick? You know, what's my catchphrase? What's this? No, no, no. Can you report? If you're a sideline reporter, can you do a concise report in 30 seconds with a lot of things going on in your immediate area? 
Can you articulate? And can you, can you ask the right questions in an interview? Are you a good listener? So in an interview, so you can ask the right follow-up question. Um, you know, for an analyst, it's always, you know, the really good analysts, they can either anticipate or they tell you why things happen as opposed just, re, in a sense, just reciting, okay, I'm seeing a replay. I can see what happened. Tell me why this happened. You know, tell me why this was a touchdown. Tell me why this was a goal in lacrosse. Tell me why this was a goal in field hockey. Um, so I think those basic attributes and then work with them to build on those attributes and give them, particularly young people, give them the confidence but also constantly reinforce without the basic fundamentals, you know, they're, they're not going to have the success that they desire. And it's no different than anybody else. You know, it's, you know, Steph Curry's the best shooter in the world. Well, it's because of the fundamentals. And how many hours and hours and hours did he work, right? So, so you mentioned, well, you mentioned, uh, you know, everyone's looking for shtick, which I think is probably true, right? Because you're looking for a unique voice, and I guess people think that shtick is a way to get a unique voice. I mean, you go, you know, Stephen A. Smith, his energy is, is in a weird way a shtick. It makes him unique, so some kid's going to say, I'm going to try to be like that. But how do they, you know, how do they develop an energy and a voice, and how can schools help them develop an energy and voice without it becoming a shtick? Well, they've, they've got to find, and we've got to help them find who they are naturally, right? Because if you try to, if you try to force something, if you try to be something that you're not, it may work once or twice. It's not going to work long term. So let's say viewers, viewers, are, viewers are really smart. They're really sophisticated. So they, they can see through something that's not, you know, that, that's not um, genuine. So with all these sports that are going to be broadcast um, and distributed digitally, let's take, let's take field hockey as an example. So you have someone who does a really good job doing the basketball and the football and, or baseball, and you say, they, you know, let's put them on the field hockey. Do you think that's fair to them? I mean, what, how do you kind of find people who can do those niche sports where they may be uncomfortable to the point where they lose their voice, if you will. Well, I think, you know, to, I give a lot of credit to Scott and to Kristen because of, of sports like field hockey, whatever, they're more, all right, where, where the pool of talent may not be as wide, right, is, is the research that they do in terms of developing and identifying and asking and researching, all right, well, here is a pool of candidates who know the sport, all right? You've got to know the sports. If you don't know the sport, again, those, if, if we're doing a field hockey match, the viewers watching that match, they know the sport. So the analysts better know the sport, because otherwise, again, the viewers see right through them. And we do a tremendous amount of, of, of research. Um, you know, we do constant auditions. Um, they will meet with, with, uh, with uh, young men and women who are interested in whether it be field hockey, whether it be lacrosse, et cetera, that type of thing. And then you get some people who, you know, because of their talent, they can kind of cross-pollinate the different sports. Yeah, we have one, one of our women's basketball players, Isis Young. Isis just graduated. She can, obviously, she's great with basketball. Um, she, she really knows soccer. She did some soccer for us. She was tremendous. She did sideline reporting for lacrosse, really showed great poise, asked the right questions and everything. And, you know, when you see somebody like that, then it's our job to grow them. Right? It's to grow them while they're at Syracuse and really to work with them and prepare them for life beyond Syracuse and try to help open doors for them. So in terms of, um, again, dealing with just talent and personnel, how do you deal with, because obviously in the university environment, there are a lot of uh, students who will have dreams, right? And their talents may not necessarily meet those dreams. So how do you kind of deal with those situations where someone's saying, I want to be on air, but it just doesn't seem to be working? And, you know, you're dealing with, Obviously, they have a career. They can develop. A, you never know. It's, it's, they're young, so they can be malleable and find their voice. But how do you kind of deal with those kind of situations where it's not the right voice for us? Yeah, you know, some, some, you know, you just got to be. You got to be honest with somebody. And you know, sometimes they may be in a curriculum. I mean, I, when I first went to Syracuse, my first semester as a broadcast journalism major. After I did like my first two tapes and reviewed all the tapes in class, I went to change my major. <laughs> I, I did. I'm like, okay, you know what? There's there's people in here that are really really good. I'm not at that level, and I switched to television film production and it turned out to be a pretty good decision. Sometimes, you know, you, you, it's self-discovery. Sometimes it's someone, whether it's Scott, Kristen, combination of a professor, a mentor, you know, encouraging them, hey, all right, this may not be the path for you, but here are so many other options you have in the media world. And I think that's one of the great attributes 
of the landscape that we're in now is, is the, how the media world has evolved in the past five, six years. I was talking to Sean Murphy, my colleagues from ESPN, and just what we've seen transpire in the past five years is, is really, really exciting, and it's only going to continue to evolve. And with that presents a wider array of opportunities for anyone who's interested in this field. And you can be really, really successful in this field behind, this, behind the camera. Sure, sure. So, when, so we have the ACC, a few more months till the ACC Network is August 20... August 22nd. 22nd. Okay, so what's your sense on August 23rd? You wake up, do you, what's your sense on the network, how you evaluate it, where it sits in your brain as far as a priority? Um, how do you kind of see that rolling out? Well, it's a, it's a huge priority for the conference. It's a huge priority for ESPN because they're a partner on it uh, in the network. It's a huge priority for the 15 schools. Um, Probably the majority of our spring meeting in Amelia Island was, was on the network. As we gear up for launch, what can the 15 schools do in concert with one another to promote the network, to work with ESPN to promote the network? Um, ESPN is responsible for secure, securing the distribution deals with the various distributors. So we've got Verizon's on board, uh, Altice is on board. We've got streaming services, Hulu, PlayStation uh, is on board. DirecTV is on board. They're in conversations, negotiations now with Charter Spectrum as their overall Charter Spectrum deal with Disney expires uh, later this year. So part of it is dis distribution. Um, and it's, you know, it's not easy to secure a carriage for a new network. Um, so that's clearly how we can help ESPN in those efforts, but they're the ones who lead those negotiations with the distributors. Then it's in terms of right, being ready to literally you know, flip the switch and be ready to produce at the 15 you know, uni universities, and I think we're all in great shape. There's been a tremendous um, commitment across the, uh, the conference by the 15 schools to get ready for this network. Again, we were fortunate. We, were, we took advantage of a tremendous asset in the Newhouse School and just the technology that was there and the control rooms that were there. If ESPN called us tomorrow and said we're launching at 12 noon, we're ready. Um, so I think the preparations have gone really, really well. I think the content of the network, um, it will be, the content will be outstanding. And, yeah, I mean, the first opening football game is Clemson, Georgia Tech. So you had defending national champions. Our opening home basketball game, opening game of the season is against Virginia on the ACC network. They just happen to be the defending national champions. So you're going to see really, really good games. I think another... Uh, great part of the network. It's going to increase dramatically the exposure for Olympic sports and women's sports in particular. And again, I think that's, you know, that'll be very, very appealing to ACC fans and to Syracuse fans. So I'm, ex I'm excited about the potential of it. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's exciting that so this has been something that's been talked about literally when I was still at ESPN. Because I was on the other side of the table making the deal with the conference to do the network. All right, now here we are 90 days out. So it's, it's real. Right, right. So on the panel today we, with some folks from the ACC network who are involved in, you know, building out the technology, facil technical facilities and figuring out programming strategies, you know, it was mentioned, you know, taking some time to figure out what other kind of programming, because the, the games in a weird way are the easy thing. I mean, they're obviously hard to do, but they fill out the schedule nicely. No question. Right? Um, and you were at ESPN where you had some day parts where you kind of looked like, hey, how do we fill out that day part with some programming? So where should they put their energy in terms of developing new ideas, either the uh, talk shows, the one-on-ones, the behind the scenes? Um, are there things that you say that, that, that you could say right now that don't worry about it and have fun and just experiment because you never know what's going to work in today's? I think what, what it does, it, it really allows us to, to, to do storytelling. And, you know, that can be across, you know, such a wide array, right? It can be a, th it can be a 30 second vignette to a 30 second show, or 30 minute show rather. Um, so I think the ability that we have now to tell the stories of our student athletes, tell the story of our coaches, our coaching staffs, tell the story of our most avid fans, you know, who's, who are those fans who've, you know, been to every home game for the past 40 years, or whatever that type of thing. So that, you know, to me, that there's, there's so much room and opportunity there. And it's one of the things that we've talked about is, is all right, how do we use this as an opportunity to tell our, tell our story? And the last question, so how do you, do you, or do you find that in general, the coaches, the players, I think the athletes understand this now, understand 
the uh, benefits of being accessible, if you will? And how do you kind of deal with some of those situations where you have the, the, the coach who really doesn't want to be part of, of a digital show? No, it's, it's a really good question, Ken. And we actually we had a staff meeting last week and we had a coaches, head coaches meeting last week. And I showed at both a clip that we did um, a spring practice with Nikki Adams, who's our women's head soccer coach. It was like a 90 second clip and it was, it was really, really good. And it just, you know, showed Nikki, you know, as a coach, as a mentor, as a teacher. And that's really good content. And I, I, told, the, I was told the coaches, I was 100% transparent. I said, ESPN and the ACC Network, they're going to ask for more access. I'm not going to mandate that you do it. But I said, I think if you forego that opportunity, you should look at this as an opportunity for recruiting. It's an opportunity to your sport. You know, the brand of our sport, the brand of athletics. So I said, I, will, I hope you embrace this. And I said, we'll do it in a way. ESPN's not there that's going to violate the sanctity of any coach, strategy, et cetera, that type of thing. We can do things in-house. And if we do things in-house, we we'll show it to the coach before it goes there to make sure that you know, he or she, that they're comfortable with all the content. But I think there's, again, I think it's a really neat way to deepen our engagement with fans. Um, I think it is a really effective recruiting tool, and while I, I haven't mandated it, and, and I, I don't like to, to, to mandate things, I think when they see other coaches do it and the benefits, right, those who are initially are skeptical, inevitably they're going to come around. So you do like that kind of transparency with the coaches showing them the stuff? Because some people would probably say, look, we're not going to show this to you. But you think that clearly, if you want to get their buy-in, yeah, it's Because, again, I want them to be comfortable. Because, I mean, I, you know, the concern any coach has, all right, you know, all right, is there going to be strategy that's, you know, you know that, that's, that's conveyed that I don't want out there? Um, is there going to be something that doesn't put me in a, in a great light? We, you know, we're, you know, we're not, we're not going to do that. Yeah. So the last and, and neither and ESPN is not going to do that either. So last question, because I know Brandon's going to get on to the next conversation, but um, social media and, uh, again, you talk about good light, bad light. Obviously, on-air personalities have been known to occasionally get in trouble on social media. Athletes, the same that thing. That never happened at ESPN when I was No, there. no, never, no. So yeah, how, do you, how do you deal with those? It's a new world, right? So how do you deal with that and making sure that the athletes understand and, and social media and, and, and you know, Education, using education, education. So you know, constant reminders um, from our communication staff. You know, here's, here's what to do, here's not to do, here's best practices, here's worst practices. And again, I think we've got to use those digital platforms, um, again, to, is, it's a promotional tool, it's a marketing tool, it's a content tool, it's an engagement tool, and the, the vast, vast majority of, of our student athletes um, and our staff, they're gonna do things the right way. And if, if, somebody, you know, if somebody does get, get, uh, get out of balance, we're gonna correct it and correct it quickly. Um, because it can be, it, you, need to, you need to look at it as here's another, here's, here's another piece of the toolbox that I have, right? But it's like any other tool, it has to be used the right way. Used the right way, it's effective. Used the wrong way, it can be damaging. Sure, sure. Well, thank you, John, for your time. Really appreciate it. Please, round of applause for Ken, John Ken, thank Wildeck. you. Thank you.